Uh, good evening, everybody. Thanks very much for coming out tonight uh, for the talks on mining oil and gas. Uh, if you're wondering why we have the microphone and the camera, uh, we've gone to live streaming this year uh, for people that can't make it and the boarding families. Uh, so <clears throat> if you want to recap, uh, there will be a link on YouTube which you can access and, and go back through things. Um, we have uh, six old boys with us tonight and they will talk through their uh, experiences of education and employment uh, and there's a fairly diverse range from fairly recent graduates to uh, people that graduated uh, a little bit longer ago. Uh, so tonight we'll start with Evan Cameron. Thank you. Hello all. Um, as you said, my name is Evan Cameron. I graduated from Hale in 2009. Um, so when I left Hale, I um, took a gap year and then went to uni and studied uh, engineering. And I ended up doing my sort of what we, what we called a program back then um, in mining engineering. So that's what my official degree is now, a Bachelor of Engineering in Mining. Um, what I did from that point was I did um, an internship, if you like, with BHP. Uh, we had to do a mandatory internship as part of our degree, um, and that was just 12 weeks. And then from that point on, I got a graduate position with BHP, working out on site, fly and fly out. So I've been at that site now for five years, give or take, and um, been in a number of roles out there uh, ranging from quite heavily like operational roles, literally operating dump trucks um, and machinery, to uh, really technical stuff where I don't really get to leave the office much. Um, what I did at Hale that kind of prepared me for my work life now is kind of, it's a mixture of all of my subjects. So. Obviously, the maths, the physics, the chemistry were really important at the start when I went into uni and furthered my studies in those sort of fields. Um, my day-to-day -day job doesn't actually involve a hell of a lot of that stuff. Um, so what I really actually excelled at at Hale wasn't the sciences so much. It was actually English and history, um, where writing essays, reports, um, structuring arguments, learning who your audience is, that kind of thing really set me up quite strongly, both in my degree at uni, um, because it gives you an edge on the communication side of things. It, a lot of people, a lot of, a lot of engineers rather, are really good at maths, really good at physics, really highly technical, but it's the ability to be able to communicate with a diverse range of people and try to convince them that you know what you're talking about. Um, especially, especially at the outset. So when you uh, arrive on site, or at least for me, I was you know, in early 20s, uh, fairly fresh um, engineer, and you have to kind of go straight into working with people with tons and tons of experience out there. Um, so being able to go from talking to managers and technical people in meetings to going out in the field and explaining the same concepts to operators who you know, maybe didn't finish high school or certainly didn't go to university. Being able to tailor your speech uh, towards that was really important. Um, and it's something that I still use pretty much every day. Uh, what are the important trends that we're kind of seeing in our industry at the moment in mining is, and you'll probably hear this from the other old boys, um, resources in general is moving towards uh, data science, autonomy, trying to um, trying to make the most of technology to kind of tighten the tighten the screws on a lot of the production side of things. So for mining, that looks like autonomous dump trucks. So dump trucks that drive themselves, drills that drill themselves, um, taking people out of the equation as much as possible, both to get them out of harm's way from a safety aspect, um, but also just to improve the consistency of what we're doing out there on the mines. So obviously robots, 
pretty much do the same thing every time. Um, humans, there's a lot more variability. So taking the variability out um, is a huge trend at the moment going forward. Um, and that's all, that's all I've really got for you guys. So I look forward to catching up and seeing what questions you have afterwards. Uh, next we'll have Daryl Harris. See, bumped into a work colleague on the panel and another one in the audience, so, so that's good. Um, so uh, I, I left Hale, I think we're going to get quite a diverse uh, age group here, so that's good. I, I left Hale in, in 1982, so that's a hell of a long time ago. And, and my story is, is possibly not what every parent would want. I didn't go leave, leave Hale and go straight to uni, finish that degree, and I'm out into professional life. I mean, I was in Faulkner House. Faulkner House is no longer there now, so I spent four years boarding. And uh, when I um, went to uni, I chose to do engineering. Um, I spent three years getting through one and a half years of engineering, and they said, you better go away and think about this for a little bit, so I did. Yeah. And, I, and I went and worked in the northwest of WA and ended up landing uh, in, in Derby. I lived in Derby for 18 months, and I worked on help building the Curtin Air Base up there. So that was, you know, that's part of your life experience, all of those things contribute to your life experience. And I came back to Perth and, and I thought, you know, well, this is not where I want to be. I've got to go to uni and get sorted out. Thankfully, by that time, I'd grown up a little bit and, and learned to focus a little bit. And I went to geophysics. I liked physics at school. I was not a star at physics or school. I wasn't a star at maths at school. When you do a geophysics degree, you do the the maths the maths students do, you do the physics the physics student do, and one of my colleagues takes great pleasure in telling me every time I see him, you know, you've got a physics degree, and um, it doesn't really help very much. But, uh, and you do the geology that the geology students do. So, so all of those things, you know, were a help and gave me a good solid grounding into what I, what I wanted to do at, at, at uni. I didn't do geology at school, so you don't need to do that to move into uh, a mining or oil and gas uh, industry. I, I did really enjoy the physics, um, and that you know was a subject. Obviously, that has stuck with me forever. So, so the key thing there is, is do what you like doing. That that is really the most important thing. But um, the the trends are really, a, a, and obviously, uh, the the controlled environment of the boarding boarding house. We used to come to this lecture theatre on a Saturday night and watch movies. Actually. That people don't do that anymore. You've got, you can watch a movie wherever you like on your phone. I'm not sure I've ever watched a movie on my phone. But um, yeah, so, so that controlled environment, uh, boarding environment for me, where we had to sit down and do two and a half hours of preparatory studies every night. So that's quite a bit different to, I think, the environment that you have now for students. You know, it's, you have to be somewhat more self-motivated and you do have a lot of distractions. But so, so you may be in a better situation than I was at that time, but you know, as, as young men, we can sometimes grow up a little more slowly than we should. So that was my journey. I've been at Woodside, I, you know, a different, different uh, case study. My interview, I did a, uh, some summer vacation work at, at Woodside, and uh, the interview about getting a job was, um, so do you want a job? That was the, more or less the extent of it. I didn't have to do a graduate program or the graduate action learning plan or the Hunger Games as some of our graduates call it now. Um, I didn't have to go through that so I was quite fortunate although I had some fantastic mentors at Woodside to teach me the, the trade and, and learn how to do things and I just want to second the, the comments about you know, communication is absolutely critical so I don't know how many of you guys are uh, fans of Brian Cox, or, you know the guy, the, what do they call him, the rock star physicist. So there is someone who can communicate really complex things very simply, and, and that is absolutely critically important. So, so my career started at Woodside. I spent, I don't know, uh, from, two th from, from when was it? From 93 to 2004 at Woodside. Then I went and worked for Shell in, in Malaysia, so I had an opportunity there. I was still Woodside parented. And Shell have, as part of their acceleration program, it, there's really three criteria. So it's intelligence, how smart are you? Can you communicate? and can you produce enough output? So it's a pretty simple formula. And, um, and I think that you know, if you can focus on those sorts of things as building your skills, that can be really useful to you. you know, obviously, you're intelligent enough because you're here and you'll go to uni and do the degrees you want. But you do need to be able to communicate your story. You need to be able to tell that factually. 
and yeah, you, you have to generate enough. You know, you have to you have to produce enough. Your, your company that employs you wants to see output, so that's all part of that. So so that's part of the challenge. So at, at uh, I went to Curtin and did a geophysics degree. I worked for a few years, and then I thought I wasn't quite learning enough, maybe because there wasn't a graduate program at that time. And I went back and did the Masters in Oil and Gas Engineering, which was run by both Curtin and the University of Western Australia. I did that part time, and that broadened my um, my scope. So, and the acronym for that is MOGI. So I've got a MOGI. It doesn't sound very impressive, I know, but that's what they they shortened it down to: the Masters in Oil and Gas Engineering. A and um, so that stood me in good stead for understanding the breadth of the industry. So that so that was really helpful. Um, so. My experience uh, at working in oil and gas ha has been one of working in different countries, worked in Malaysia, worked in Australia. I haven't, I, I, as a geo, you get to go and do a few interesting field trips. So I managed to go to Utah and look at the book cliffs in Utah and done some, uh, some in southern Spain, we went to a field course. So whether that, all of that sounds really sexy, but I think where the industry is going now, you, you're probably not gonna work for an oil and gas company, you're probably gonna work for an energy company. You know, Woodside and many other companies are starting to look at hydrogen, it's starting to look at energy now, not just oil and gas. So that's where that part of it is going. And you absolutely need to have some digital skills. You know, it's about being able to use artificial intelligence, of use coding to, to get things working, to do things that, that you want to do to get the most out of the data because there is a lot of data involved. Unfortunately, we're not as good as organising that data as we should be, but artificial intelligence can help with that and digital can help with that. So uh, I'll leave it at that and uh, happy to talk to anybody uh, afterwards if they've got any further questions. Thank you. So um, I guess I'll, I'll start at the end and then come back to it, but I, I'd, I'd like to convince you why environment, uh, engineering is, uh, is a great flexible option if you don't know what you want to do is in your career. So um, I'll, I'll come back to engineering, but um, there, are, there are many different aspects and roles in oil and gas and um, all integral to an, uh, to an efficient operation um, from you know, commerce, HR, um, safety aspects, design, uh, technical, digital, as there's, a, there's a lot. But I guess in, in engineering, which is the discipline I'm in, uh, there, are, there are lots of different opportunities that you can, that you can apply and, and ad adjust throughout your entire career. I didn't know what I wanted to do when I was at school, uh, and I thought I'd uh, apply for uh, general engineering, environmental engineering, because I like geography. I did geography at the expense and um, the concern of my French French teacher, who loved me to do French, but I was more interested in geography, and um, that gave, gave a good opportunity to then apply um, some of the the science and maths that we, you've gone through uh, in a, in a career, and then work to to different opportunities throughout your career. So. Uh, I've been at Woodside for 12 years. I'm an environmental engineer. Uh, I studied um, honours in, honours of environmental engineering at UWA and a land and water management degree, which is a science degree, uh, which is, has some aspects of biology and a bit of agriculture, um, um, geography, geology types to it. But um, I was really sort of really committed to the environmental engineering aspects where you learn the fundamentals, the physics, um, electrical engineering, a whole foundation of different skills. Um, and then uh, took a graduate position at, at Woodside uh, and has, have been involved in different, different projects, um, different experiences throughout the way. Uh, one of the ways I explain what my role is in a, in a, in a large company like Woodside with different um, operations and developments in and around the world uh, is my job is to understand uh, the key um, technical aspects of each of the, some each of the specialist disciplines, and um, be able to articulate risk and opportunity when it pertains to environment or a process safety outcome between the disciplines. So, um, and and really embed and develop a, a discipline in, in unto itself, um, where environmental engineering um, can can see opportunities and risks across the the gamut of um, of, of the oil and gas spectrum from drilling wells, um, laying pipeline, offshore platforms, um, onshore development into LNG. So uh, I was 
privileged to be involved in the Pluto LNG uh, construction, commissioning startup and operations um, for five years in Caratha. Um, and, and that gave me a really good, a solid technical foundation to then look at other opportunities in the company. So, um, so I guess I touched on, uh, yeah, I, was at uni at, I finished school here in, at Hale in 2001 uh, and graduated from UWA in 2006. Uh, and the in environmental engineering gave uh, sort of opportunities in mining, um, uh, minerals processing, um, civil geotechnical, which is I did some vacation work in just digging some test pits for housing developments. And, and, and that was a really good opportunity when you come to apply for jobs to, to actually talk to um, why, why it's really important to focus on how you, um, how you plan your work and focus on safety and particularly in, um, in and around moving infrastructure, look after your people, keep them safe all the time. So uh, that, that is a great um, opportunity to, to, to bring in to your, um, into your, your, I guess your program through uni and otherwise. Um, there's other aspects around environmental engineering, working for utilities um, like the Water Corp, land planning de, um, development groups, agriculture, um, and, and regulators as well, a key part of um, ensuring, um, ensuring like a long-term sustainable industry. So uh, my journey at Hale, I, I was thinking about this and I, I, it didn't really take me long to wrap up my experiences at Hale, go through a uni and then think about what um, is so important in my, in my, in my work. I'm privileged to be able to work in an, in an, array, in, in an environment where uh, the fundamental values of um, your integrity, trust, discipline, um, setting a high standard for yourself um, and working within teams about that creates a fair, fair place to work. So all of, your, all of the experiences you guys uh, get exposed to at school, um, all, all through, all through your, your work actually set you up for that and it's your duty on your badge um, it's your duty to hold yourself to account to those values and also um, it, and owe, you owe that to your people who you work with and the communities in which you're working with um, as in, in the company. So whether it be communities around the world or um, here in and around place, it, it really is um, a key factor. When, when you look at other industries such as, uh, I shouldn't name industries, but if, if you see industries where uh, you get poor behaviours, um, corruption, unfair behaviour, bullying, um, it, it really erodes the whole um, arrangement around, around that. So I, I thought Hale gave me those opportunities um, to, really, to really learn that without really realising it. Um, so hold yourself to account and, and, and not owe it to others, I think is a really good place in, um, and carry that through your studies, your career. Um, the experiences, I guess, around what you really learn, uh, I think sporting, Sporting and the extra, extracurricular activities is really a key experience that um, develops your resilience, your determination, and, and your ability to learn courage. So, um, whether it's um, starting a new subject, you're, you're not quite sure if you'll be able to master um, your, your sporting achievements with your teams, learning how to work as a team, setting a high standard, maybe getting knocked down, but getting back up and learning as a group and pushing forward. So. Um, that autonomy that you get from those experiences um, allow you then to set your own set your own goals. It doesn't matter what you if you if you don't know what you want to do, just have that confidence and carry and carry that throughout your career. Um, I did I did physics, chemistry, maths, um, and English lit and geography as as my school school subjects. But as I mentioned, I, I don't I think it, it subjects is really around giving your best opportunity for flexibility and, and that's why I come back to engineering where you can do engineering, do some technical work for 5, 10, 20 years and decide that you want to branch in to do a commerce or a marketing arrangement or even learn some legal um, aspects or there, there's a lot of flexibility and post-grad post studies that you can take on from an engineering platform. Uh, so I would encourage that. If you don't know what you want to do, you, that doesn't matter, you can find that out later. Um, but give yourself the opportunity by, by applying your determination and be courageous in your selection um, and, and give yourself that ability to be flexible into the future. Um, so uh, with the impacts on um, future shaping of the indus industry, so what are the key things? Um, I won't talk to um, technology and digital because I think um, the guys will talk to that, but I really around um, res 
the responsibilities of companies to evolve and change with public perception. So environmental engineering, um, there's a lot of um, focus on climate change and, and market responses to climate change. So um, what is the role of oil and gas? And, and that's a really key piece for oil and gas to acknowledge and, and move. What is, what is, is it oil and gas or is it an energy supply? And how do, what is the role of gas as an important um, supporting, supporting um, energy source into a new renewable future? And so um, many of the studies out of the in international IPCC studies and CSIRO um, reports show that, um, that oil and gas is a very important part of the energy mix moving forward. So I'm proud of that and I work in, um, in a role where it's my job to ensure that we, we do things responsibly and look after the communities we operate in. So um, I, I think it's a great, great option, great career. Um, and, there's, and there's certainly more scope we're looking forward in environmental engineering as well. So. Thanks very much. Uh, so I'm the youngest of the group. I haven't got a job yet. I'm looking though. Um, I graduated in 2016 and straight afterwards I applied to a university in the United Kingdom called Loughborough University. Uh, I'm studying chemical engineering currently, but before I went, because there's a nine month gap, uh, I had nothing to do, basically. And rather than getting a job, I decided to increase uh, my skills and knowledge. So I went on a TAFE course, which was run by the Australian Petroleum Planning, I can't remember the acronym, but um, uh, it was a six month course on process operations cert two and technical engineering cert three uh, down in Munster, run by South Metropolitan TAFE. They don't run the scholarship anymore, unfortunately, so it was free for me, not anymore. Um, they, Chevron does run a women's one, which is very similar. Um, but what it taught me really was health and safety, confined space, um, maintenance of plant, and it was very hands-on. So even though I did physics, chemistry, uh, engineering studies, and Hale, you didn't need that to go into it. Um, so after graduating from the TAFE course, I went over to study uh, chemical engineering in the UK. Honestly, I think the process operation has taught me more about design than the actual uni course. I mean, I was telling the lecturers some things that they were saying, oh, it was too advanced, and I went, is it? <laughs> you know? Um, it's prepared me more for oil and gas than anything else. Um, one thing which my class was told was it's very easy to get into oil and gas with this, but you can get other courses in working at Hyatt's confined space entry or gas testing, which are, a, you can find them in places in Perth. I also did a helicopter underwater escape training and basic offshore survival uh, course training uh, in Fremantle. And I think the more courses you have, if you don't want to go to the university route, it will increase your chances of getting a job further, but you have to make sure that you can definitely pass all the drug alcohol screening tests, otherwise you're out for life. My lecturer stressed that in um, TAFE for some reason. <laughs> uh, second, what subjects uh, at school best prepared me? I would say engineering studies, uh, physics and chemistry are very good for going into university, but preparing me in general, I'd probably say to be honest, rugby. <laughs> You know, like, you've got to get the team spirit going and make sure, especially on a shift, we had one guy with nine health and safety violations in one day. Um, yeah, we, uh, we would take bets on how many he'd get, actually. <laughs> but, um, yeah, when I was in TAFE, we were working in a shift of about six people, rotating shifts of panel operator, field operator, uh, team leader, all that kind of stuff. And I found that if you don't trust your team, which I didn't because the guy had nine health and safety violations, you go out and check what they've done. So as he's walking back going, oh yeah, I've done everything. And then you go, you've got three valves open and your shoes untied. You know, you gotta make sure that everyone's safe at all times. I almost had a violation because I forgot my helmet. But um, generally, very good course. Uh, lecturer was great, knew a lot of stuff. And you don't need too much to go into the TAFE course. So if anyone's worrying about marks, don't. Um, so yeah, my subjects in the hail. Engineering studies is quite good. Uh, we did a project on life cycle analysis, which makes you think more critically about all the things we use, throw out, where does it go? Oh, well, I just threw it out in the bin. 
turns out it's got mercury, it's going into the groundwater, and uh, we'll worry about that in 20 years, but who cares? Um, so yeah, engineering studies is a good one. Rugby, because you do have to have the team spirit, you know, you can't just go, I'm doing this for myself and only me. You've got to think around, you know, what's everyone else doing? How can I help them learn something new? Eventually they can help me, you know? So teamwork's essential. Uh, number three, um, because I don't have a job yet, but I do want to go into the oil and gas industry like my parents. My dad helped me write this bit. <laughs> but um, I, what I've seen in energy companies, there's a big move towards better health and safety. Um, one of my friends, she said that they have this thing in ExxonMobil called a touch, where even if you're doing something as simple as making coffee, someone will walk up to you and go, have you thought about the health and safety risks of that coffee? You know, I mean, it's a bit over the top, but uh, she's quitting. She, <laughs> she doesn't like it, but um, she is still looking for other jobs. I mean, you know, too much health and safety sometimes hampers progress, but you do need it because I actually, um, I got an internship with a steel company and an invitation to come back, but steel is kind of dying in the UK, so not many job prospects there, where we actually did have two deaths, but they're in India, but in mine, a guy lost two fingers and every week we get a red stripe which is a health and safety violation what happened how can we fix it one of them was a 500 um, ton rated crane broke at 250 and they went oh we're, we're analyzing this and then you look inside there's a giant bubble you know like how's the crane going to support any weight if it's got a giant bubble in there with no strength and um so yeah health and safety big thing Another thing is research into catalyst biofuels and hydrogen as possible energy sources. Um, there's also one, the CSIRO recently created a catalyst which allows you to pr produce hydrogen from ammonia. So the benefit of that is ammonia is an inert, so it won't explode, so you can easily transport it, convert it into hydrogen, and then burn it then. Whereas if you just transport it as hydrogen, you'll get the Hindenburg. Um, so yeah, a big... Uh, as it was said before, you know, they're not oil and gas companies now, they're moving towards energy companies, focusing on solar, wind, uh, hydroelectric. Um, and one, uh, I guess, issue at the moment is the idea of fracking, which is when you start pumping hydraulic fluid into the base, increasing the porosity, and getting more gas out of the ground. Unfortunately, sometimes that means you get a flaming shower, in the US anyway. So um, they don't necessarily want to go on with this if they can get uh, energy from other sources, like you know, LNG is a good one as well. But there are risks going ahead, which is why chemical engineering comes into play. Um, it's a very good degree because you can easily diversify. I mean, chemical engineers go into uh, pharmaceuticals, oil and gas, mining, food industry, um, nuclear. Australia is not big on nuclear, wonder why. Um, but yeah, if you want a degree which you can easily diversify chemical engineering, I'd definitely say it's a good one. And that's pretty much all my time, I think. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name's Kelvin. Um, first of all, sorry for being late. Accident on the way in. Sometimes you, you can plan all your life, but uh, things don't always go according to plan, which is probably what uh, I'll tell you a little bit about my career, which didn't go according to plan, but ended up pretty good so far. So I'll give you a little bit of insight on that. Um, look, just to get started, um, obviously, this is a career investigation, so you guys will be keen to know what I've done, um, and hopefully, some of that you can use in your career. Uh, so I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that, um, give you my experience, and I'll give you some tips from a millennial. Okay? I'm one of you guys. Only just graduated in 2007, I believe it was from Hale. Um, so I've, I've been through the interview process and I'll tell you a little bit about that. But first and foremost, I work for South 32. Uh, South 32 demerged from BHP in about 2015. Um, so we're mining a metals company. So uh, my role there is a purchasing supervisor. So I look after a team of 10 uh, who report through myself. Um, they essentially, what my team looks after all the purchasing of all the materials and equipment for all the fill. Yeah, and I report through to what's called our, our global purchasing manager. So everything that we need to buy for all the equipment, for all the guys on site, for our engineers to do some work, I like to remind them of that, they need to come through us, right? So, so, so we play a role in enabling them to do all the cool things that they can do. Just, just reminding you about that. <laughs> Procurement, yeah. 
Um, so look, what, 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 what did I do when I graduated? Uh, it was quite simple. I, I took the slightly easy route. My family is full of a, a bunch of business owners, so I did business, uh, because for me it just made sense, and, and that's what I knew. Uh, so I did a Bachelor of Commerce. I did accounting, um, which is what I did at Hale as well. Um, I specialized in accounting. I did investment finance, because I really wanted to be an investment banker. I thought that was the cool thing to do, and I thought working 80 hours was the cool thing to do. <laughs> it's not. So I, I really don't encourage you that, that that's not the work life balance, but anyway, that's what some people choose. But that's what I thought was, was, was where my career was going to go. Um, following a, a failure to get into one of the investment banks, I decided to change course, but um, I then decided to go straight into my master's after I graduated. With my master's, I did international business, electronic business, marketing, and electronic marketing. I believe that was the first time someone had done four specialization courses at a year, four advanced degree. The aim of that is really because I'm the kind of guy that wants to go overseas and, and work there, right? Uh, that's that's kind of the in thing. I want that experience, and so international business gives you the capability to do just that. What I wanted to do, though, was accounting. Um, oh, my family is full of accountants. My brother-in-law is an accountant. My mother's an accountant. My sister's an accountant. And I have another sister who's an accountant. So naturally, that's what you do. I wanted to do accounting. Um, fortunately for me, I was in a position where I got offered a role um, at the bank um, as a graduate accountant there, but also got a role at Chevron uh, in supply chain management. Uh, Chevron was a big employer in the market, and so I decided I was going to go there. Uh, nothing other than a, a gut feeling. You know, I decided to take a risk, and that's what I did. Best decision of my life, I think. Nothing wrong with this side, by the way. <laughs> Just for me personally. So I did supply chain management. Completely unplanned, but I decided to give it a go. Uh, the reason I'm telling you it's unplanned is because sometimes you plan all you want, but sometimes you decide to, to go a different path, and that's okay. You, it, it, honestly, it's okay. You've got a whole career ahead of you. Things do go into the path that you want to eventually. So what I did there, I did purchasing, um, did procurement for a year, decided that it was a little bit too easy for me, and so I asked for a bit of talent. Uh, I told my boss, I said, look, I want to do something that's a, bit, a little bit more difficult. He said, okay, and I got seconded into Borgen. Uh, at the time, Borgen was the largest resource project, and I think still holds the record for the largest resource project ever take, undertaken in Australia. Yeah. Um, and that's obviously LNG and all the like domestic gas as well. Did that for about a year. Um, I then uh, got promoted, uh, did a lot of closeout work again in procurement, and got promoted again to procurement lead on the Rogan project. And so I worked with a lot of expats. That was really exciting. Um, I then looked at my career trajectory and decided that um, I thought I wasn't advancing as quick as I should. So I took a plunge and decided to go work for RAC, a lot of RAC, the insurance company. A lot of people thought I was absolutely insane for making that decision. So did I. But I decided, look, I, I need to take a risk in my life. You're not going to go anywhere, folks, but I'm taking a risk. I'm taking that. Uh, about five months in, uh, to my role at RAC, I was a commercial contract specialist there. Uh, South Korea Crew called. Um, and they just said, Kelvin, we've seen, we've got your resume across our desk. Uh, you've got the experience you want. We want you to come on board. And I said, okay, let's go. It's literally a conversation with my wife. And that's what I did. Completely unplanned. Um, and that's where I am now. So I guess with regards to what subjects prepared me, look, anything general business, where engineering is a good way to start. I will say that because if you want to work in the resources industry, engineering degrees always get you in and then you can always move into a business degree subsequent down the track. So I generally think that's good advice. Um, and you can do a master of business administration. It's a little bit difficult to go the other way where you haven't done engineering, you're going from business and then you want to do engineering. It's, it's quite a little bit challenging. So that I think that's, I actually think that's quite sound advice. So I, I certainly concur with that. Um, but I, I just wanted to quickly touch on, I guess, the skills, because for me, it's the skills that you learn here that'll set you up. Uh, the good thing about study is it's so mobile these days, you can always change course, okay? So if you decide that what you're doing, you're not finding fulfillment in that, you can always change direction, and there's a lot of online learning you can do. Oh, guys, you can always get an engineering degree or a business degree by studying online or going to university. So rather than focus on the technical, what you should do, I'll tell you some of the skills that, I, that I've seen in my career. Probably attempted about 15 or 20 interviews in the last six years. Um, I've failed at about 18 of those, but every time you go to one, you get more experience and it sets you up for the next one. Okay? And I kid you not, for your first job, you'll probably send about 50 applications and you'll get rejected for about 40 of them. It, that's just the reality of it. It's really competitive out there, but you just have to keep going. And I guess that for me is basically the first skill. The first skill that you learn, I think, team, you know, um, playing sports and teams helps you is resilience. Folks, I can't tell you enough how much resilience is important because you will fail, <laughs> it does happen, and you just have to pick yourself up and keep going.
Okay, so that's the first one. And sports gives you a little bit of that. Um, the second one I really think is communication is so underrated. Okay? You can be as strong technically, but if you want to progress up the ladder, you're going to need to know how to talk to people. You're going to need to know how to connect. And empathy becomes important. The higher you go up the chain, the less it is about the technical what you know, and it becomes more about how you can manage and communicate with people. So that's, that's really fundamentally important. Um, and I think, for me, um, when, if you're thinking from the technical side, any, if you can do anything that contains data analytics, that's really good. So AI, data analytics, if you can analyze that and deliver that in, in a succinct way, that's really going to take you far. So if you're looking at science, engineering degrees, anything that contains data, um, I think that's the way to go. So that's kind of my advice to you so far. You can talk to me afterwards. I'll share a little bit more about what I do and what I've seen and the interview experiences that I've failed because you don't learn anything unless you fail. And one of my favorite sayings is saying success gives success gives you the illusion that failure is impossible. So, you know, uh, that's that's it for me. So I, I hope you take that away and, and feel free to come talk to me afterwards as well. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. I retired five years ago at the age of 74. Before that, I spent 50 years in the mining industry and I loved every minute. I wanted a career that combined science, the open air and opportunity for travel. Geology was recommended by my science teacher at Hale um, at the end of my year 12. Although he was known as rigor mortis, <laughs> he was right on the money. I graduated in science, majoring in geology at UWA in 1961, and then went on to a PhD in applied geochemistry at the Royal School of Mines, which is a college of London University. Along the way, I was recruited by Western Mining Corp, or WMC. WMC was in 1962 a small mineral exploration and mining company operating with all its operations out of Kalgoorlie. After a succession of discoveries of nickel, gold, copper, aluminium and other commodities, it had grown to be a top 10 Australian company by the time I left in 1986. It is still known as the gold standard in mineral exploration long after it was taken over by BHP. After leaving WMC, I set up business as a consultant specialising in geochemical exploration. Geochemical exploration, for those that don't have never heard of it, is based on the strategy of traditional prospecting, but using developments in modern science to broaden its scope and to hone its effectiveness. Modern exploration consists of a mix of geology, geophysics and geochemistry. Mineral discoveries usually result from a combination of methods and teamwork. However, I have seen many discoveries of nickel, copper and gold, which largely resulted from geochemistry. Throughout my career, I was constantly learning, looking for new commodities in different geological environments exploring in different parts of the globe and adapting to new developments in technology. And I played my own small part in this. The most helpful study, subjects I studied at Hale were mathematics, physics, chemistry and English. English is, and this is a recurring theme of these talks, English is essential to express your ideas and persuade management or investors to finance drilling your targets. Information technology was not available in my days at Hale, but now is an indispensable part of the industry. Likewise, statistics was not a part of the math syllabus in my day, but was the branch of maths that I used most in my uh, career as a geochemist. As a city boy, a Dago, I also valued the experience of mixing with borders from rural areas at Hale. In the holidays, I often visited their farms 
and uh, developed a love and appreciation of regional Australia, which influenced my choice of career. Mining and mineral exploration will continue to be a major facet of the Australian economy. It is a natural fit given our climate and endowment. Don't believe the people who say mining is simply digging up Australia and selling it overseas. Finding, mining and processing minerals is a high-tech business and becoming increasingly so. The Australian mining industry is world-class. That's my contribution. so I'll try and keep this short and sweet. Um, I'll open by saying that I was probably not the best student when I was at Hale. I think the last time I remember being in this room I was actually in detention. But <laughs> that, that was a long time ago and a lot's changed since then. So my formal background, I'm a geologist. Um, for the engineers in the room, I'll say don't hold that against me. I'm actually more of an engineer than I am a geologist. Um, so I graduated here in 2002 and I went to UWA. Again, not having any idea what I was going to do with my life, so I did a science degree. So that would be my bit of a career advice. If you don't know what you're doing, start a science degree, start an engineering degree. I think everybody says the same thing. Um, look, from there, I joined BHP. Actually, I, I was, I'll back up a bit actually. I was very fortunate. I left the industry at a time when things were booming. Um, I got offered, my first job offer was for a Canadian mob called CGG, um, which the oil and gas boys will know them. Um, I was going on a seismic exploration ship in the Arctic Circle for, I think, six months. But anyway, I took some very good career advice from a guy by the name of Rob, Rob Seggy, for those of you who have seen Rob Woodside, and he said, whatever you do, don't go and work for a, um, a basically a contracting firm straight up out of uni, because whatever you can do for your career, go get operational experience. So I had to turn that job down, and I went and got a job Fifo in the Pilbara working for BHP, and that was the best thing I ever did. Um, I'm not saying I love Fifo out of the Pilbara. It's a tough experience. It's a hard industry. Um, I did four years there. Um, I quit. And I went overseas. I went to Sierra Leone. Actually, I'll back up. I went to work in Mauritania, um, exploration, getting shot at, um, meeting, meeting my own camels. It, it was a rough year. I went to Sierra Leone. I caught malaria seven times. I've had typhoid twice. Um, it, it's rough. From there, um, I've come back to WA. I've come back to Australia. I've done an MBA. I've worked for Glencore as a finance analyst. I have been a my other titles, I have been superintendent of integrated planning, so that's for guys in large iron ore operations, you need to make sure that when you've got a big ship coming in, you've got enough ore at the port, you've got enough stuff that can mine, um, and you need to integrate the whole thing. So I used to manage that out of West Africa for a large, it's not a large iron ore operation, it's 40, well, 36 million tonnes a year, it's big, but still all right. Um, we built that up from the start. The start. Um, from there, Came back, did an MBA, worked for Glencore, which is a Swiss multinational, for those of you who know what that is. Um, and now I've, I was, my last role, I was the production and maintenance operations manager for Holston, um, up in the hills here, so that's the inquiry you see in the uh, Darling Star. I quit there because they wouldn't pay me enough money. Um, <laughs> and I became an independent consultant. Um, and at the moment I'm working for a pseudo, the, the Kazakhstan government in a sort of pseudo mining operation so I got back about a week ago. Um, it's long hours. Um, I won't over make how glamorous it is working expatriate. Um, it's not, it's long, it's isolating. You're living in a hotel room, you're on your own. Um, you know, your family, your friends are back here. Um, you know, and I'll, to give you an example of the isolation that's involved in expat work, it's not that you're isolated. You're not in a remote place, you're in a nice city, but the only person I've got to talk to is my translator. That's the only person I've got around me and I've got to go three or four days at a time literally living with them, you know, you get up, they all eat breakfast, you spend the day with them, they've got to come out with you for dinner, it's hard work. Um, anyway, it pays all right, so I'm not complaining. Um, however, saying that, so what have I just done at Hale? The fundamentals are, and these guys have already said this, you've got to get your English right. You've got to be able to write, you've got to be able to communicate. Um, maths, Yes, um, for those of you doing the calculus derivatives, I don't use derivatives on a daily basis. I occasionally use trig, I occasionally use algebra. I need to be able to, you need to be able to understand data, so you need to be able to use Excel um, and all of those other data analytics programs. The biggest thing that I'd say has benefited my career would be that 
I was a little bit of a nerd in school and I got involved in a thing called computer club. I believe you guys get taught coding and that's a great thing as part of your syllabus. Um, I got involved in computer club, I got involved in a few other extracurricular activities that I won't go into. Um, but I, I, what I can do is I can structure logic so I can see a problem and I understand how a computer thinks and I can make the computer do that. Why that's benefited me, I'm not a computer coder by any sense, but it's got being able to fix, recognise trends in data, pull data apart and fix that data back to front has got me on the radar of senior management on many occasions. I'll give you an example. I started working in Sierra Leone and I was just back going through this data and just something just wasn't making sense to me. And I said, oh, yeah, whatever. Um, I just went to the technical services manager. I said, come have a look at this. Cut a long story short, the laboratory manager had recalibrated some of our um, chemical assays for an XRF machine for X-ray fluorescence. And basically we were throwing ore over the side of the pit. You know, we'd we lost about $25 million in revenue, we reckon, by about this point. And cool. He got a term, in this mining industry term called a window seat. Some of you may know what that means. Um, that's called Don't Come Monday. So that means here's an air ticket, here's a nice window seat. Goodbye, enjoy your life, don't come back. Um, he got one of them. I got a promotion. Um, <laughs> but look, yeah, you've got to be good with data and yeah, because that will get you on the, on the thing. But data and analytics are growing in strength. Um, if I had to say another good thing that I learned at Hale would be economics. And what I learned about economics is supply and demand. You need to be able to anticipate what the market is going to be doing two to three to five years out. And you need to be able to position yourself for that next move. Um, you know, right now I'm comfortable being a consultant. Um, I think that the industry is going to tighten over the next three to five years for people like me. However, saying that, three to five years ago, it was a different thing. You know, you knew that we were at the peak of the boom. If you had a secure job, you sat tight. You last thing you want to find yourself is unemployed. So you need to be able to think three, five years ahead in your career. And I'm not saying everything works out because it doesn't. Um, and you need to roll with the punches and resilience. But if you can sort of think in terms of supply and demand, you can sort of think about how you're going to position yourself with respect to that side. So that's helped me a lot. Um, and the final question was, where do I see the industry going? I'm not going to talk about technology, I've already spoken about data. What I will say, just one thing that's going to impact you guys when you enter the, the industry, and I think this is not related necessarily to the mining industry, is we're seeing a lot of um, companies, especially larger companies, they're, they're de-risking their recruitment processes um, and they're probably streamlining their onboarding and they're using a lot more labour hire companies. Now, that's got a negative perception within society at the moment. Um, but you've got to look at it from a company's perspective. And I'll give you an example. Um, I hired a girl when I was in my old role, when I was out at Holson. Um, she had just graduated university with a psychology degree. And unfortunately, she was competing in a pool of a lot of people um, and she couldn't get any work. So I brought her on as a waywards operator. You know, but just put her in the corner and have a look at her. She proved to me that she was keen. She wanted to learn new things. She's now running the distribution centre for Holson for all the concrete trucks around Australia in about 18 months. So, you know, you're gonna, you're, I think, what was the number that you gave? 48 job applications you're gonna send out? You might get three, two responses. Roll with the punches, it's a tough job market, um, but at the same time, don't be afraid to get your hands dirty and get your foot in the door and just get yourself on the radar. Um, you know what I mean? You're better, off and, you're better off learning some new skills and just being there, and if you're good at what you do, you will get promoted. So, love what you do as well, that helps me with you. All right, thanks guys. Uh, thanks, ladies and gentlemen. I'm just going to ask Nancy to take the old boys up into the main administration. I'll finish up with a few points. And then if you'd like to come into the new foyer there, there's tea, coffee, fellas, there's cookies, and there's some juice. And then you can uh, have a further chat with the, with the old Halians. Thank you very much, guys. I just want to start with what Alex uh, Johnson said about the TAFE program. So um, while that specific program is shut down, the National Energy Technicians Training Scheme, I think is probably something that has replaced that. So uh, that's managed by programmed. And basically what the NET scheme is, it's an apprenticeship program. It's an offshore oil and gas opportunity for about 20 apprentices every year. Uh, that includes the people that are subscribed to that are Woodside, Santos, Shell, 
Impex. There's one other that escapes me. Basically, there's three sort of trades that you can get out of that. There's uh, electrical and instrumentation, process plan and operations, and mechanical fitter. So if there's students in here or people that are interested in trades, that is one that you can apply for this time. It opens uh, August 1 for about two weeks. Last year we had a boarder, uh, Marty Rowe, who had done the ATAR, got an ATAR score of just under 80, got a conceded pass in English, which you don't see too much, which is at 49.5%. Uh, could have gone off to university, but he went through the NETS program. So the way that that works is it is a application, psychometric test, interview one, interview two, you might get a job. About 1,700 people from WA apply for that, and he was one of two to get the trade. So I think what got Marty across the line was that being a farm or from the farm and working 12-hour shifts during harvest time and the like, that had put him in good stead for what will happen in his second, or sorry, third and fourth year, where he'll be on site working as uh, doing two week swings for the last two years of his um, qualification. So at the moment, he, like Alex said, is down at South Metro TAFE uh, at their Munster processing plant. So there are lots of different apprenticeships that you can get into the oil and gas industry or the mining industry. So Rio Tinto, BHP, uh, they've all, BHP's just closed in regards to their apprenticeships. Rio's just about to open. Program will open for the nets. Uh, Woodside has different opportunities as well. Um, so if you are interested in that and you're in year 10 and 11 and not too late in year 12 to this point, don't discount that. I think we, we saw a bit of a shift last year where we had three ATAR students who chose to do a trade as opposed to go directly into university. And I sort of thought about that for a while because if you imagine you, you, you're 18 when you finish school, you go and do four years, you're 22 when you finish your trade, you can always go back to university at any point now. Education has really sort of opened up since about 2012. Uh, when the tertiary sector became a little bit more deregulated. And why not, if you're interested, go do a trade. At the age of 22, you've got some life experience under your belt, then go back, do your three-year degree, and transition on for your future that way. You would, I would think you would never be unemployable. And even interestingly, whilst you're doing your degree, if you've got a trade, you could be doing the old cashy on the weekend. God bless, I had one of those blokes come in on Saturday to my house and do some work for me. Fantastic. Um, I just thought these were some key takeaways for me um, and I, I really enjoy these events because I learn a great deal from, from the old boys. Um, I thought it was really good to hear that the humanities are great for communication, uh, so that report writing. But coupled with that was that data science and autonomy and machine learning and coding and computer science are all very important as well. Um, that notion of life experience. I think, boys, because you're very young at this point, it really is about amassing a wide range of experiences. Um, enjoy your subjects. For those of you that are in year 10 and looking to that subject selection process, you want to make sure that you enjoy them. You want to make sure that you pick subjects that are as challenging as you possibly can and that are going to keep as many opportunities open to you when you transition from year 12 to whatever it is you do after school. Um, I thought it was also interesting to hear from Kelvin talk about the mobility of study and that don't necessarily think that you're going to follow a specific plan. Um, it so often changes. When I talk to the universities now, I think the change rate from first year to second year is almost around 50%. So students will enrol in their degree, start their degree, get to the end of semester one or get to the end of semester two and they'll make a change. Okay, And that is completely okay. I was saying to my year nines the other day and it was interesting to hear uh, Richard Mazzucchelli say, you know, I retired at 74. You know, that uh, if you're retiring at 75, and God bless the Australian Federal Government because it'll be 70 when I need to finish, so you young blokes, probably 75. If my maths is right, 
um, that would mean that you'll work for about 57 years. So you've got plenty of time. Don't rush, okay? Uh, and parents may not necessarily like to hear that from the staying at home and university and all that, but you do have a lot longer time in the workforce. Um, and I'll just finish up on, I thought the, the comment from Kelvin too about resilience, communication, and I think the last one he mentioned, and we don't necessarily highlight this enough, is that notion of connection. We're really in this global society now, and it is about connection. You know, I often have a bit of a chuckle. Not, I take my, I've got young kids, five and three. We take them on the train, and if you, you no one looks at anyone anymore. Everyone looks at this. Um, and you lose that sense of connection. And I think that was something that I thought was um, very important. Just on closing, uh, boys, if you're interested, parents as well, I'm a bit of a fan of the World Economic Forum, uh, which was started by Klaus Schwab. He talks a lot about the fourth industrial revolution. Um, there's a website on, on their page which is called Strategic Intelligence and it produces a lot of network maps once you sign up for all the different sort of trends and countries around the world and it's a, it's a fairly good insight into the different opportunities that are available uh, to you post school. Uh, like I said, once we wrap up here, if you'd like to move into the new foyer, tea, coffee, cookies, thanks very much for coming. Have a good night.